Justin. Whoa. <laughs> uh, okay. There we go. <laughs> a little less loud. How is everybody tonight? I'm so glad to be back with you. Uh, this is our last night. It's hard to believe. I know we're going to have a dinosaur dig tomorrow, and I'm looking forward to that. We're going to be excavating dinosaurs, but uh, this will be our last class together. And uh, like uh, Justin said, we've got a lot to cover tonight, a lot of fun things. By the way, thank you all. Y'all all have asked me so many. Uh, important and exciting questions. You've challenged me to go back and study more, and uh, I know uh, I'll uh, put a plug in to Brother Bob back there and his books. Uh, that I'm going to buy. I've already chosen three books I'm going to buy that uh, going to learn more about this stuff. There's some great books out there on the table, and uh, that, that they're selling. And we appreciate always learning and growing. And these are things that we can continue to learn about. What a great, great focus this has been this week uh, as a church to uh, have this focus in which basically what we're saying to the world, which uh, a lot of times does not believe what the scriptures teach concerning the beginning of uh, history of mankind. It's been a great focus to look at the things that show the historicity and the truth of God's inspired word. And again, as we said two or three times in this lesson, uh, Romans 10, 17, our faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We study the word of God, we follow the word of God, but there are all these wonderful external uh, things that uh, illustrate uh, the scripture for us and dinosaurs is one of them. I love dinosaurs too. Were y'all singing along with the skit? Uh, I love dinosaurs and one of the kids was telling me, I love a T-Rex and a little girl was telling me a minute ago, well, I love the raptors and I'm thinking uh, well I would be scared of them but I do love them I love studying them and uh, we're going to be talking tonight about dinosaurs and the flood and also this is a, a scriptural lesson we're going to look at some uh, scriptural points that will motivate us in our faith as we go forward the Bible says as Christians and all of us are Christians the Bible says that we're to be able to give an answer Concerning the uh, faith that we have, uh, in First uh, Peter chapter three and verse fifteen, it also says we'd be able to give an answer concerning the hope that we have, and the Scripture and learning these things as we've been learning them this week gives us greater hope and greater faith. And uh, so let's begin. Everybody open your Bible, if you've got it, to uh, Job chapter 40, and we're going to read verses 15 through 19. That's the beginning of our lesson tonight. Job chapter 40, 15 through 19, and there the scripture says, look at the behemoth which I made among you, which feeds on grass like an ox. What strength he has in his loins. What power in the muscles of his belly. His tail sways like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are close-knit. His bones are tubes of bronze. His limbs like rods of iron. He ranks first among the works of God. Yet his maker can approach him with his sword. God created the dinosaurs. This is one, one of many places in the scripture that talk about dinosaurs. And uh, God created all things. And a dinosaur is a part of it. So uh, let's look at this together tonight. First of all, in the late 18th and 19th century, a number of geologists, y'all, began to agree that the Thick sedimentary rock layers of the earth were not formed quickly like by global flood, but slowly over long ages. They begin to use this to create doubt in the teaching of the scripture, the early history of man in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. As a result of this shift in interpretation, y'all, a number of Christians begin to reinterpret these verses concerning the flood and early man. And this view has continued to this day. But here's the problem with that. At the same time, honest people will admit, y'all, 
that the story of the flood is written like a story, like a historical narrative. And it is. It uses the language of historical narrative. As a matter of fact, when the scripture talks about Moses and the Exodus, when it talks about David and uh, capturing the city of the Jebusites, which became Jerusalem, his capital, as it talks about uh, Peter and, uh, and James and John fishing on the Sea of Galilee, it's written as history. And, of course, the early Bible is written as history, the early stories. But people began to have a problem. They said, well, science says the earth is millions and millions of years old, but the Bible just reads like God created the heavens and earth in six days, and I've got this conflict. And I'm talking to Christians tonight, okay? A lot of Christians have a problem with this, okay? They want to agree with science, and they want to agree with the Bible, that's as we've looked at and our stance as we're going to go on tonight and look at this further. Uh, you, that's really impossible because this line of thinking leads to a new set of questions. And we want to begin with this tonight. And please talk if you have questions like Justin said. Uh, ask. Our first question is, if the Bible is not true, in Genesis 6, 7, 8, and 9, the story of the flood, if the Bible is not true and, and there was no universal flood, the whole earth was flooded uh, and, and the animals that were saved were the ones on the ark, okay, there were dinosaurs on the ark. There were baby dinosaurs on the ark. I'm sure there were probably dinosaur eggs on the ark, right? And uh, so, so uh, Noah was told to collect these animals to save them, and God was going to destroy the earth because of the wickedness of man. Uh, well, here we go. If Noah, if the flood was not universal, y'all, and it did not happen, and all the animals were saved on the ark, we ask the question, why did Noah need an ark? You know, sometimes we don't stop and ask that question. Why did Noah need an ark? Okay, if it was a local flood, why did Noah need an ark? What's the obvious thing? What's the obvious answer to that? If it was a local flood, why did he need an ark? He wouldn't have needed an ark. What Noah would have done and what the animals would have done, naturally, they would have kept moving on the face of the earth and gone to higher ground and stayed on higher ground and waited the flood out, right? If it was a local flood. But a lot of people, even a lot of Christian people, believers, seem to think or seem to want to uh, have the story of naturalistic macro evolution, which we talked about in our first class uh, Monday night, and the Bible to mesh and coexist. Well, it cannot, beloved, mesh and coexist. If there was not an ark exactly like the scripture, historically written, it's a historical narrative, Genesis is, if it did not happen like the Bible says it did, then Noah wouldn't have needed an ark. Here we go. After all, if the flood was local, why go through all the trouble of building an ark? Okay, number two, why did Noah need an ark, y'all? Why was Noah told to save two of every animal when they could have easily survived in other parts of the world? We don't think about that when we're trying to mesh or agree with naturalistic science and the Bible. Why was the vessel as big as the ark needed? Maybe Noah, if the animals were going to run up into the hills and be saved, he could have just had a little bitty boat for his eight uh, members of his family, right? Number next, why did God say he was going to destroy? And here's the problem here, folks. God said, God said, let's, we have to get back to that. God said that he was going to destroy all flesh. What does all mean? We forget how to define the word all. What does all mean? Somebody define it for me. What does all mean? It means everyone, everything, okay? So why did God say in the text he was going to destroy all flesh everywhere when he really wasn't, okay? If God promised not to flood the earth again, why do major local floods continue to occur all over the world? If this was just a local flood and God put a rainbow in the sky, by the way, the rainbow represents God, 
okay? We have a problem in our country of making it now want to represent something else. It represents God's promise, God's promise that he will never flood the world again, right? So here we go, folks. Number next, why has the vocabulary used in Genesis always been interpreted to refer to the global flood up until the 18th century. And that's how I begin the class. In the 18th century, mankind began to change concerning the biblical stories. Okay? What was going on in the 16th century, in the 15th century, in the 14th century, in the 11th century, in the 10th century? And here's the important thing. In the 1st and 2nd century, when people were closer to the writing of Scripture and the teaching of the Holy Word of God. They believed it back then. Why did we all of a sudden in our modern era think, well, the Bible can't be true because science shows that it's not true. That's arrogance to the uttermost, folks. That's arrogance to the uttermost. And shame on us for doing that as humans. And we do that. We really do. We're doing that in our civilization. Why has the vocabulary used in Genesis always been interpreted to refer to a global flood? In the final way, answer of why did Noah need an ark? Why do other people in the Bible, Peter, okay, Peter's important, right? Peter's important. But the next person in this slide and in sentence is more important than anyone. Jesus. Why did Jesus refer to the flood and even use it in Matthew 24 and talk about it as the historical happening that it was to warn us to prepare for his second coming if it did not happen? Okay, here we go. Going on in our lesson, dinosaurs and human. We just read the verse, look at the behemoth. Tell me the other word that talks about a dinosaur in the book of Job. Anybody know? What's the other word? There's another, another animal mentioned in the book of Job. We'll get to that later on in the lesson if you don't want to answer it right now. But uh, what's the other word? What? Leviathan. Leviathan. Exactly right. And the Leviathan, we're going to look at his description in a minute. I'll show you a picture of it. But uh, of him, it's a him, it's not a her. Uh, and uh, but we're going to look at the Leviathan, and we will also see he's a dinosaur. So going on, let's look at some very interesting things. Here's here's what we're going to look at tonight, y'all. Let's we're going to look at the fossils of dinosaurs, okay? And then number next after that, we're going to look at uh, evidence that dinosaurs continue to exist after the flood. We're going to look at that. Okay, and then after that, we're going to uh, conclude with why the flood is so important in teaching Scripture. Okay, here we go. So we got a lot to cover. Number next, how many of you, raise your hand, it's one of my favorite movies. I love all the adventure, archaeology, cool movies. I love Indiana Jones, and I love Tomb Raider, right? Tomb Raider. If you ever watch the movie Tomb Raider, you see this during the movie. Okay, what we're going to do, y'all, is dinosaur fossils were used as evidence to support the theory of evolution, okay, but we're changing that, and we're going to say, because it is true, however, when we look closer, beloved, we see that the fossil record, in fact, supports the creationist Bible perspective, okay? Okay. That's our, our goal in these next eight minutes, okay? Number one, when the flood happened and all the animals were killed, who were killed, they were buried rapidly. They were buried rapidly. They were sometimes found in large numbers, and they're found in large numbers and large burials. Uh, Scientists say the flood often happened in the plains where the dinosaurs would li have lived. However, dinosaur fossils sometimes stretch over thousands of square miles, y'all, that we found. The beds were not made from small seasonal floods. They were made from a global flood that flooded the whole earth. And then at the end of the flood, 
all of those waters, all of those fossils, all of those dead animals had to go somewhere. Some dinosaur fossils, for example, have even been found in marine deposits suggesting that they were washed out to sea. As a matter of fact, not long ago, just a few years ago, and well, the Bob in the back may help me with this, pronouncing these words. Uh, not long ago, a uh, Scelidosaurus, Scelidosaurus, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. It's S-C-E-L-I-D, Scelidosaurus, fossil was founded, founded, surrounded by algae and shells. And the fossil even had skin tissue left. The heaviest dinosaur that was ever found when you're looking at fossil graveyards is the 10-ton Argentinosaurus, and it's the largest one ever found. He's a seropod, if I'm pronouncing that right, seropod, that could have been 50 meters long and 40 meters tall. These animals do not prove evolution, folks. They Disprove it. Now, let me show you why we say that, okay? This huge, giant, giant, giant fossil of this huge dinosaur, 10, 100-ton dinosaur was found, but animals with such diversity and such size, and that would have been the biggest animal probably anyone ever found and form, must have had a recognizable lineage. But this lineage cannot be found in the fossil record, okay? There's no, no uh, fossils before him, okay? As a matter of fact, large group of dinosaur eggs have been found all over the world. And a paleontologist, Luis Cepeti, uh, said, scientists have found so many dinosaur eggs remains that it appears catastrophic catastrophic flooding struck all of these nesting grounds keeping many eggs from hatching and floods would have penetrated their porous shells y'all and drowned the embryos so thousands and thousands of, of uh, uh, eggs have been found now the bible y'all is clear that humans were alive at the same time as dinosaurs we've already seen this example in Job we were created to take dominion over all that God had just created, and Adam named every kind of animal after they were created. Genesis 1 says God created the great beast, and what category do you think the dinosaurs would be in? <laughs> the great beast category, right? They would, have been, they would have been great beast. We've already talked about one dinosaur that was 100 ton large, uh, Genesis 1 says that God created the great beast, so therefore there was no dinosaur era, y'all. Millions and millions of years before humans evolved. Dinosaur soft tissue and original organics included proteins provide strong evidence for the recently of dinosaurs as well as the way the mass majority of them perished off the earth. Further, many dinosaurs have designs that feature and features that give clues. As a, as a matter of fact, there have been numerous, and I'll show you a slide in just a second. There have been numerous, not thousands, but there's been numerous of uh, examples of DNA testing, and people have even found dinosaur soft tissue, meaning that they could not have lived thousands and thousands and millions and millions of years ago. Now, over 50 scientific peer-reviewed journal articles describe 14 bioorganic materials and dinosaur bones that simply should not exist if the dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago. So the Bible was clear. The Bible is clear. The ancestors of every animal that ever lived were created during creation week. Each basic animal type was created after his kind, and all subsequent individual animals, including dinosaurs, y'all, descended from these created categories. 
Day six was the creation of all land animals. Since dinosaurs were land creatures for a variety of sizes and habits, they would be included among the various kinds of living creatures. Okay? They were of necessity, air breathing and land dwelling. At first, everything was very good. But what happened? What happened to our world? At first, everything was very good. Dinosaurs were very good. You probably could have had maybe dinosaurs as pets. Adam named them. They lived in the garden with him. They lived with early man. But what happened? What happened, y'all? Huh? Sin. Sin entered the story, right? Noah was told to take on board the ark, two of every kind of created animal, in whose nostrils were the breath of life and dinosaurs breathed air. So he took dinosaurs on the ark. Outside the ark, marine creatures died by the trillions, but at least some of them may have survived to continue the kinds after the flood. As a matter of fact, here's something that's interesting, and we'll get into this at the end of the lesson. Here's something that's interesting. Many sailors, y'all, many sailors throughout the centuries have talked about seeing sea creatures that were huge and interesting and possibly even in the ocean today. There may be some sea creatures left that were dinosaurs. The land and flying dinosaurs could only have survived the ark only to disembark at the end of the flood into a strange and hostile world. People ask the question all the time, what happened to the dinosaurs, okay? Well, as far as we know, we don't know. <laughs> there was no comet that hit the earth. We do know that. There was no mass destruction because if the comet hit the earth, it would have hit man too because man lived with the dinosaurs, okay? Okay, so what happened to the dinosaurs? Well, first of all, after the flood, probably, y'all, the environmental conditions with the sparse vegetation and the destruction of the pre-flood canopy and the temperature extremes during the ensuing coming ice age would have caused many of them to die out. But we don't think they all died out. And that's what's interesting, and we're going to look at that in just a second. It's a good evidence, as a matter of fact, folks, that they survived for a while. God's description of this large behemoth in Job 40 sounds remarkably like a very large sauropod. And the description of the Leviathan. Everybody open your Bibles to Job 41. Job 41. It seems to imply the kind of huge, fearsome beast recorded in many of the dragon legends. We're going to talk about dragons in a minute. But many of the dragon legends from every continent around the globe. Okay, let's talk about this. Sober historians, these are sober historians, real historians, in the ancient world talked about seeing dragons. Okay, let's show some pictures here. First of all, that possibly could have been one. The accuracy of that picture, scholars will tell you, historians will tell you, and this is a Ceratopicus carving on ancient Cambodian temple, and uh, they uh, obviously saw that animal to be so accurate in their description of him, okay? We're going to make all dinosaurs him. Okay, the Nazca people in Peru. Uh, this is a quilt, an ancient, ancient quilt in which they uh, quilted a dinosaur, okay? And uh, that's interesting. They possibly saw that dinosaur, that dragon. Ancient people a lot of times would call dinosaurs dragons. Number next, the Inca stone circles. A few years ago, I was able to, I was on a mission trip to Inca Peru, and at the end of the trip, our uh, mission director said, Gary, uh, we want to go uh, downtown here in Inca, and we want to visit a guy. And I said, okay, that's cool. I thought it was to do a Bible study or something. And so I went with him, and we walked into this house, which was a museum. And this man, he was a professor 
and Peru, he had collected thousands of stones that had been uh, left at burial sites of the Inca people, okay? The Incas are the native, uh, native people of Peru. And uh, he, uh, uh, he had collected all these stones, and these stones were very interesting. We got to see them. They were found in 1961 by farmers beneath the sands of the vast desert of Ochochi off the coast of Inca, Peru. And uh, he found all of these stones, and look at the stones here. They had all these drawings. Now, these were gravestones that the Inca people had done in the historical era, okay? As a matter of fact, what's interesting in that picture you have the stone, and then the uh, bottom of the picture shows the fossil skin of the animal that uh, they are depicting. Well, we believe that's a form of a dinosaur, or what they would have called a dragon during that time. This is a close-up of some of the stones. What do you see in this picture here? Let's see. Let's do my little red thing here. What do you see in this picture here? Uh, you see some, what is that? What kind of dinosaur is that? Some of you know all these dinosaur names. That's a dinosaur, right? Everybody see that? This is a dinosaur here, and he's a plant-eating dinosaur. See him eating up there on the tree, okay? And this, of course, is the dinosaur with the horn, Okay? Now, the Incas had hundreds of these stones. This professor had these stones in his house. And here's another one. And look what's cool about that one. Everybody see that? Everybody see that? What's going on with that guy? <laughs> huh? This guy here, I don't know what's coming out of his mouth. I know what would be coming out of my mouth if I was riding that dinosaur. This guy's riding a dinosaur, right? And uh, this is... Uh, pretty awesome dinosaur there and maybe he used that to climb those were his stairs he climbed up to the top of the dinosaur hopped down in his saddle and uh he's that's he's probably saying help that's help in Incan okay <laughs> I'm not sure what it is but uh he's on top of the dinosaur there well he may not have ever really rode the dinosaur but here's the point they very possibly could have saw these animals. They were very, very uh, 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 correct in drawing them. As a matter of fact, here's another one we see in the United States, y'all. Okay, look at this picture. See the Native Americans right there? Okay, and they're probably on this dinosaur hunt. See the dinosaur and that pictograph. And, of course, this is the famous footprints. You have human and dinosaur footprints in the same strata, okay? And then here's a better picture of it. Uh, this shows uh, a Native American drawing a dinosaur. Here's the dinosaur out here, and, and they're watching him out here, and this Native American drawing a picture of him, okay? And... Uh, so very possibly dinosaurs continue to live. This is a Native American petrograph. Uh, this is under uh, a bridge at the Natural Bridge Natural National Monument, y'all, in Utah. Okay, and this is it. This is what it really looks like. You can see it there pretty well, but this one is more enhanced. And uh, so here's the question. Here's the point. How would they have known what these animals look like before fossils were found? As a matter of fact, this, would, this last picture, let me make a point about this. This is found at the Natural, National Bridges Monument Museum. And it shows it's, uh, the Anasazi Indians found this. They lived in the area until the 1300s A.D. Okay, 1300 A.D. Now listen to this point, y'all. The first complete dinosaur skeleton was discovered in 1858 A.D. So how did they know what the dinosaur looked like 
if because it was some 200 and something years before the first complete skeleton like these were found and were able to be put on display where people could study them, okay? There's an ancient Mesopotamian artifact, proves a clue to the ancients existed with dinosaurs. This comes from 3300 B.C., right here, right here, 3300 B.C., uh, the seal displays two long-necked animals that are striking, strikingly resemble, y'all, a seropod uh, dinosaur. And one can logically conclude that the artist who created the seal would have had to have seen a representative of a dinosaur or a living specimen to make such an accurate depiction. Also found on different cliff Faces near the Great Lakes, another interesting uh, picture right here. As you can see, this is a uh, Sioux Indians. The Sioux Indians claim this, and they believe this creature inhabits the Missouri River. Okay? Now, the Sioux tribe have been documented saying the creature had a backbone just like a cross-cut saw, and in the middle of his forehead was one horn, as you can see in that picture. The pictographs of this creature show an animal with a jagged back similar to a dinosaur's back and two horns proceeding from his head. And in very recently, in 1920, Bud Chal Chalmers was removing rocks from his ranch outside the town of Granby, Colorado. When he lifted one that weighed more than he expected, curiously, he decided to wash the rock off. Here's what he found, okay? That's a picture of what he found. He found a long-necked dinosaur, okay, as you can see right there, and he found a woolly mammoth depicted by Native Americans uh, somewhere in the last three or four centuries, okay? Now, what does this show us? Shows us that very possibly dinosaurs did exist after the flood. The, the Bible doesn't say they did or didn't, but the Bible does say in Job's time, which was written during the patriarchal era, there were two different types of dinosaurs that Job could have seen. But the main part of the story is this, y'all. Here's the devotional part of the story. First of all, God calls the flood, God calls the flood, to judge the earth. And if we spend our time, if we spend our time like we said, not believing in what the scripture says about anything, but especially the flood, Jesus and Peter both used the story of the flood, the story of early man and the story of uh, first 11 chapters of Genesis to tell us our story of salvation. The main story of the flood is simply this, y'all. It shows us how serious sin is, right? A lot of people nowadays don't seem to get the seriousness of sin. They don't think it's that big a deal. They don't think it's that big a deal, and they say, what's up with God flooding the whole world? What's up with this? When we read here, though, the story in Genesis 6, 7, 8, and 9, beloved, we hear God responding to human sin with a worldwide flood. And we shouldn't be asking the question, what's up with God, or what's wrong with God? That's not the question. The question is, what's up with us? I don't think any human being, any finite creature, can fully understand how offensively, how cosmically offensive our sins are to God. We can't understand how offense our sin is, to a perfect, holy, almighty God. But also the flood shows God's mercy. There was a man. He was a preacher of righteousness. He obeyed God and his family. And God saved him and through him recreated the world. And that's the beautiful story of the Genesis and the flood. Dinosaurs were there. Dinosaurs were created by God. Uh, they were a part of our world. And anyone who tries to teach or say or encourage us not to believe in them or not to believe they were uh, coexistent 
from the first six days of creation with the rest of the world is uh, really putting doubt in people's minds concerning the true, whole, full story of God's word. The story of Noah and the flood is just a shadow, a type, y'all, of the greater salvation all of us have in Christ Jesus our Lord. If Noah's family benefited from his righteousness, how much more do we benefit, beloved, from God's righteousness today? If Noah's family was carried along and saved because of the righteousness of Noah, how much more will we be saved from the wrath to come through the righteousness of Jesus Christ our Lord? And we will be saved according to God because of his great power creating the world and everything that exists in it and that we can study about, we can read about, and we can learn from the scripture how to be God's people and be faithful to him. Okay? That's really the main story of this. Here we go. There are flood myths around the world that illustrate. Let's go on. Uh, Around the, you would think that if there's only one world, and there is, there it is. Let me back up. I'm going the wrong way. Sorry. Yeah, here we go. Uh, you would think that if there's one world and the flood covered the whole world, everybody in the world that lived in the world that spread out from uh, Noah's three sons. What are Noah's three sons' names? Huh? Shem, Ham, and Jacob. All of us are kin to them. We're all kin to each other. You know that? Yet we're all kin to each other, all right? Noah's three sons. You would think that if there was one world and one flood that flooded the whole world, and then after that flood, mankind was able to leave the ark and repopulate the world, people would be talking about it, right? I think I would talk about a flood, wouldn't you? <laughs> a catastrophe of such magnitude. Well, people did talk about the flood. That's exactly what we would expect if it's a historical true story. And it is. And here we go. Let's look at some fun things here, y'all. Number one, the Africans, the Maasai, where Brother Justin worked and labored with his wife Anna, they have a flood uh, story, don't they? The Maasai are the people who live in eastern uh, Tanzania and uh, also Kenya. Uh, they have a flood story, which uh, all the stories have these characteristics, y'all. Let me show you what these are. They all have a story. They all say there was a man in transgression. transgression. There was sin in the world. There was a divine cause. God stepped in and uh, was going to punish the sin. There was a favored family in the story. The ark provided human and animals preserved in a vessel. An ark was provided, and the world was destroyed by water. All of these stories that we're going to look at in the next three minutes have these characteristics. And, of course, it sounds like what? <laughs> sounds like the story in Genesis 6, 7, 8, and 9. Okay? Very much so. All right, let's back up here. Sorry, I got my slides out of order. Okay, the Africans have a story. Here's their story. Here you have the African uh, people. And the ark, their story had one man who saved the world. The animals went into the boat and they were saved. You have Native Americans have a lot of stories and we're going to look at some of them in just a second. You have the Chinese have the flood legends and they had a boat and a couple. There they are who saved the world. Flood legends of Mexico, okay. There, see, there's the mountain of Mexico about to be covered in water. And the Greeks have a story. Okay, a flood story. There's the Acropolis up there and the, the uh, land being flooded. Why do you think all these people have a story? Because all of them were either direct descendants of Shem or Ham or Jacob. The, and when they moved all over the world, they told the story of what had happened to their ancestors. Scandinavia, there's a flood story. Greece, there's a flood story. Um, there's a flood story, the Sumerian flood story, the Gilgamesh epic, the Akkadian flood story. Uh, all of these places have flood stories. This, by the way, is where it would have happened and began. Then you have stories migrating over here to the United States. We've already mentioned them. Uh, all right. All of these places on the map have flood stories. Okay. Uh, so there's a flood story in Hawaii. I'm going to tell you some of these stories in a minute. 
uh, China, Mexico, Babylon. As you can see, they all have these characteristics. A boat, a saved family, a family that saves the world. Okay, and here's the Hawaiian one. Long after the death of K, I'm not going to pronounce the name, the first man, the world became a wicked, terrible place to live. There was one good man left, and his name was Nuru. Nuru. Sort of kind of sounds like Noah, right? <laughs> and his name was Nuru, and he made a great canoe with a house on it and filled it with animals. The waters came up over all the earth, killed all the people. Only Nuru and his family were saved. Where do you think he got that story? They got that story. <laughs> They got it from Scripture, didn't they? Because that's what happened. That's exactly what happened to, to the people. Also, number next, you have other flood stories. Flood legend stories. The Cherokees have one. North Georgia, North Alabama, the Cherokees have a flood story. Uh, all the native, uh, Ma the Navajos have a flood story. Uh, and that's a depiction of some of that. The Aztecs have a flood story. The creator warns Tapai, an Aztec man, uh, of the coming flood on the earth. Tapai builds a boat and saves humanity because of that. So all of these flood stories show that this is something that happened and that early man had it in his conscious memory. And when he did have the, it in his conscious memory, he was able to write it down. Okay? So now, how many more minutes do I have, Brother Justin? How many more minutes? Huh? Okay, good, good. We have a lot of time. Okay. I was afraid I was going to run out of time. Okay, let's stop right here and let's spend a few moments answering your questions, okay? And then I've got a, another closing uh, thing to say. What questions would do you have? Hmm? Anybody? I think that's the last slide, it is, yeah. So we have the flood legends, proving the flood happened. We have the carvings of dinosaurs uh, by people long after the flood happened. We have the fossil deposits of the dinosaurs. Uh, there's a man and dinosaur track together. How, how many of you have heard of Pollux River tracks? Pollux River track. This is a man and dinosaur. See the man footprint, see the dinosaur footprint in the same strata there? That's in Texas, by the way. Okay. All right. This is one of the petrographs. This is how they probably happen. They're probably wise up there on the cave, in the cave, right? <laughs> uh, do what? It, it's a modern illustration of how how very possibly that could have happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would uh, no. They they didn't. If it was, it would be pretty cool because we could we could have a lot of knowledge about you know what they dress like and. And everything else. No, it's just showing. We have these cave. We have these cave paintings like that, and it's just a depiction on maybe how they did it. Okay. In other words, the point is, y'all, they were close enough to see them. They saw. They saw these animals. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh huh. What, what is your theory about the, uh, the carbon fourteen dating? Is that something that man came up with to? No, no. It's it's it's. Uh, Carbon-14 is very scientific except for the fact that the rate of carbon decay decreases uh, as you go through many, many years. You're, you're very accurate with carbon. We use carbon-14 on our dig sites because our dig site is 800 B.C. So, but when you go back and when scientists tell us that the earth is billions and billions and billions of years old, uh, there, there's nothing... There's no way to cal calibrate the carbon decay rate 
back that far. So we, we just, car, carbon, it, it disintegrates. And I've read a lot of articles over the years. Uh, it can be accurate to help us up until, you know, around 800, 1,000 B.C., but older than that, you're, 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 we just, we're not accurate. We don't, we don't know that. So what they do, though, is they use that. See, they have to have, naturalistic evolutionists have to have billions and billions of years for this to happen because they know it didn't happen in what we find on the earth today. And so they have to come up with these billions and billions of years. And, you know, they're honest, good people, most of them. They just, you know, they just have a different worldview than we do as Christians. So, yeah, carbon-14 does not disprove, yeah, a scripture. Yes, sir. As far as we know, the, the closest thing, and Bob may know this answer too, uh, as, as far as we know, we've never found any humans and dinosaurs buried together or, or you know, uh, together. But it, it, it's really amazing that you do have all these accurate, very accurate, uh, autonomically correct paintings of these dinosaurs, which we feel like, well, they had to have seen them, or maybe granddad saw them and, and drew a picture, you know, and then they were able to draw them on the cave walls. But no, sir, we, we, we never have found. But there's one thing uh, we, we, I was going to talk about, but I decided not to because it's sort of kind of myth and conjecture, but... Uh, there was, uh, on up into the 1800s, there were a lot of stories, especially in Africa and in China, of dragons, that people would see dragons. And dragons very possibly were dinosaurs that were still living. Of course, even the, uh, those of us who are of English ancestry, uh, King George slaying the dragon, you know, the myth and uh, different things like that. So... Uh, very possibly a few dinosaurs did live. And I even, I even read uh, not too long ago that said there could be some dinosaurs still in the seas. You know, uh, sailors would see things uh, even recently. I mean, in the 1950s and 60s in the sea. And they would say, wait a minute, this, this is not, this, this has to be a dinosaur. It, it has to be a dragon-like creature. Yeah. I don't think that I think they're a, a separate genus species, and all genus species can can change within the genus species. But I, I don't think so. I think dinosaurs were so uh, unique, and of course the fossils show us, you know, how unique and amazing they were. And you got to remember, we didn't know anything about them until what? When? What did I give the quote? The first full dinosaur fossil was 1850, and that's you know. 10 years before the Civil War started, and uh, just give you a perspective. So, yeah, yeah, we, uh, but uh, I, I think the flood stories, the stories of the flood happening and all of these people, and the same people within that same time frame still telling the flood stories or drawing the pictures of the dinosaurs and the Inca stone. I tell you what, I wish y'all could all have been with me. If you're in Inca Peru and you walk into this old professor's house that has shelf after shelf after shelf, and these were burial stones of the Incas, the Incan Indians, and he had all of these, and he said, just pick them up and look at them. You picked them up, and they're covered in dust. <sighs> We'd have to blow them off, and they had these clear pictures of man and that one I showed you of riding the dinosaur you know I, I think he had to make that up to brag or something but there's no way he wrote him but he may have it may have been the last thing he did but uh but um yeah I think I think those two evidences showing maybe dinosaurs did could did well we do believe they certainly existed after the flood because again Noah, just like our place said today, you know, Noah would have had dinosaurs on the ark. Well, that's God wanted to save dinosaurs for a while anyway, right? 
and uh, there was there was a use for them. Yes, sir. Right, right. But it hasn't. The atmosphere is not. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. Changes the rate of the carbon-14 decay. You're exactly right. And, and the canopy was destroyed. So you had the canopy before the flood. That was destroyed. So the rate of, of sunlight, the ray, rate of ultraviolet, you know, that all changed. So you cannot go back. Now, again, you know, people get on to carbon-14. You know, it can be good. It helps us, you know, up until just, you know, maybe, you know, 1,000 BC, but before, after that, the rate of carbon decay in the in the 14 molecule, you know, it does change, and it's not accurate. Yeah, uh huh. Yeah. Any other question? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. They found soft tissue. Uh, uh, Try to think exactly the first place they found it. When I did the Genesis History Conference, I was with a scientist that had done the study, one of the scientists that did the study on the soft tissue. Uh, it, was a, it was a fossil that was found, and, and they were able, they dug into the fossil itself, and uh, they, uh, you know, they... Uh, so uh, we got DNA then? I don't know if the DNA was still viable, but it did... The tissue, basically what, what it shows is that dinosaurs didn't live billions and billions and billions of years ago. They're, they're you know, they live, you know, close to us in time, you know. Yeah, that's really what it proves, yeah. Yeah, it would be neat. Uh, of course, the, the theme of Jurassic Park is they took the DNA and made dinosaurs. We haven't done that yet, but maybe. <laughs> be a little scary, though, wouldn't it? Yes, sir. Uh-huh. Right, right. Uh, well, first of all, evaporation, the clouds, uh, we don't know. We don't know. I mean, you just had, we just had to, we would have had to have been there. If God created the heavens and the earth in six days, he can say floodwaters go away. You know, God, we have to have a scientific explanation for everything that happens in our world. God got rid of it. We don't know. We do know, we do know that there's fossils. We do know that there is uh, uh, marine fossils on top of Mount Everest. How did they get up there? Uh, we do know that there are marine fossils on top of large mountains. You know, there's no way that marine fossils could have gotten up there unless the ocean got up that high. And uh, Bob, you want to say something about that? Yeah. 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 Uh, right, right. Yeah. So it rose up after. Yeah. So, uh, and, and of course, the canopy was broken. There was water, you know, the, the water came from the, the center of the earth, burst forth. The flood just didn't happen because of rain. Water was coming from, from the earth upward, like geysers, great big, huge geysers were coming up. So, uh, yeah. Uh huh. Right. Yes, sir. He could rearrange it how he wanted to. Right. His control. His control. Oh, right, right. And because uh, project, yeah, pro probably logically the days of the flood, if it was, a, it was, if it was natural processes, we probably wouldn't have had dry land again in that, that period of time without another miracle by God. Without another God doing that, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any anything else? I wanted to leave time for questions. By the way, um, <laughs> hey, I'm I'm. There's so much more to learn about this. I, I want to. Uh, uh, 
Go buy Bob's books. Uh, <laughs> there's, uh, there's so much more to learn. There's a lot of men. Uh, I was privileged, like I said, to study in the, as Genesis history, with the Genesis history guys. Just, just amazing scientists out there who are believers, who believe in creationism, who do not believe in naturalistic evolution, which is a religion, a worldview, more than true science in a, in, in a lot of cases. And... Uh, we, we have an answer. We can, we can be confident that we have an answer. We don't have to feel as God's people, as Christians today, that, you know, all the scientists have the answers. And we, uh, number one, we have the answer because we have the Word of God, right? We have the answer because we have the Word of God. Thank you. Is our time up? Is there, I don't know what time it is. I have no idea. Is there time? Okay. Time's up. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I've loved being with you. Uh, there's so much more I could have done with you, and maybe maybe I can come back sometime or whatever, but there's so many other uh, uh, facets of this to study. I just uh, enjoyed, enjoyed studying with you, though. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. You're dismissed. Okay. 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 Did y'all take good notes? Do you learn anything? Did you? <laughs> Well...